If you're looking to diversify into international markets, gain exposure into more financials, or just add a couple more high yielding dividend stocks to your portfolio, consider bank stocks over in Canada. We'll take a look at the five major Canadian bank stocks. All of them reported their Q4 results last week. We'll jump into these results in a broad perspective. Just take a look at the revenues and earnings. We'll also compare them on some valuation metrics determine our fair value assessment for each of these companies. As always, take a look at the technicals and even share a broad-based ETF I think you could invest in in order to gain exposure into this space. As always, if you are new to the channel and find this type of content valuable, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button below. It would mean a lot. The five Canadian banks we are taking a look at today are the Bank of Nova Scotia, otherwise known as Scotiabank, TD Bank, CIBC, RBC, and Bank of Montreal or BMO. I will have timestamps for each of these in the description below. Be sure to jump to the one that interests you the most. Without further ado, jumping into Scotiabank's Q4 results, though their revenues came in at $8.31 billion. Keep in mind, all of these figures in this video are going to be in Canadian dollars. All these companies are traded on the TSX, and I believe some of them are traded on the New York Stock Exchange as well. But for simplicity, I'll just be covering the prices in Canadian dollars and on the TSX. And so revenues for Bank of Nova Scotia came in at $8.31 billion. That was growth of 9% year over year. Now the story for all of these banks in their Q4 earnings was basically their provisions for credit losses increased drastically on a year over year basis. Quarter over quarter, not so much, considering on their Q3, they were still putting away quite a bit of provisions for credit losses. And essentially all these provisions for credit losses is is that if people start defaulting on their home loans, auto loans, even credit cards, yeah, these banks are gonna have to cover those bad credit losses. And so we see Bank of Nova Scotia put aside nearly 1.2 billion Canadian dollars. That was an increase of $727 million compared to same time last year where they just put aside roughly $530 million. So again, year over year, that is a big, big jump on these provisions for credit losses. Essentially, I think these banks are getting ahead and preparing for really people to start defaulting more and more and considering how high interest rates have stayed for the really past over the year. Yeah, they expect more people to continue defaulting on home loans, auto loans, credit card loans. And so in order to cover those credit losses, these major Canadian banks are putting aside more and more money for these provisions. And essentially what that does is hurt their bottom line in the short term. In the long term, as interest rates continue to drop over the next few years, yeah, these provisions for credit losses will again flow back into the business and come down to their bottom line. So really this is the story over at these banks is they're putting aside more and more money for these provisions for credit losses. Now over at Scotiabank, they did, this was roughly a month and a half ago, they did announce a headcount reduction by close to 3%. That would cause them a $432 million charge. And so we'll also see this reflect in Scotiabank's earnings as they will likely take a hit in the near term to their bottom line in order to reduce their head count. Now, moving over to Toronto Dominion Bank, otherwise known as TD, they reported earnings of $13.2 billion. That was their top line revenues, growth of nearly 7.7% on a year over year basis. Now, TD also raised their dividend by close to 6.3%, now coming in at a dollar two cents on a Canadian dividend. Keep in mind, this is a company trading at $81.91. That is a forward dividend yield of close to 5%. And so they were able to increase that by up to 6%. This is the other major news story surrounding Canadian banks is that nearly all of them are still able to raise their dividends, even though earnings have been declining, even though they're putting aside more and more money for these provisions for credit losses. Yeah, nearly all of them are still able to increase their dividend and we'll take a look at really what all of their dividend ratios have now become and we'll see if they really have room to continue raising these dividends over the next few years. Moving on to Bank of Montreal, ticker symbol BMO, trading at close to $113 per share. Their revenues actually declined close to 21% year over year. So revenues came in at 8.4 billion Canadian dollars. That was a decline of 21%. This was the only bank that actually saw revenues decline and pretty substantially in their Q4. Again, their provisions for credit losses increased substantially. A year ago, they were putting aside close to 226 million Canadian dollars. Now they put aside nearly 446 million dollars. So a big jump year over year. And yeah, that will hurt their EPS again in the short term. In the long term, expected to once again be an addition to profitability. Similar story over at BMO that we saw at TD, they were able to 
increase their dividend not by 6% but closer to 3% on that increase for dividend now coming in at a dollar 51 cents so again this company able to raise their dividends even though revenues and earnings declined on a year over year basis so these banks certainly are seeing something that you know down the road they're able to maintain these higher dividends and possibly increase them as well moving on to CIBC Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce now this company reported earnings their provisions for credit losses came in at 541 million dollars that was up 24 percent from same quarter last year so increased 24 percent year over year their revenues also came in at 5.84 billion dollars that is again up eight percent on a year over year basis it's also important to keep in mind that some of these banks are more heavily related to the united states and have more business in the united states compared to a canada certainly if you look at a bank like td they have roughly 60% of their revenues coming from Canada and then 40% coming from the United States. A bank like Scotiabank, more heavily related to just the Canadian market, same with ACIBC. And so certainly certain banks are more heavily open to the United States economy. Same thing we saw at the other two banks. CIBC also raised their dividend close to 3%, now coming in at 90 cents per share. Moving on to the last but not least, RBC, ticker symbol RY. This one reported earnings revenues grew at nearly 4% came in at $13.3 billion. Again, we see provisions for credit losses increased 89% year over year now coming in at $720 million. Last year we were at just $340 million. They also were able to raise their dividend by 2% now coming in at $1.38. That is a forward yield of close to 4.65%. So all these companies having a relatively substantial yield. Now I have the five year price return pulled up for each of these companies. You see certain companies do tend to outperform the other banks. We take a look at RBC's five year return up over 26%. Certainly not drastic capital gains. Keep in mind, these are Canadian banks with very low growth. They're not your high flying tech stocks. And so expect that very moderate capital growth, but with the dividends paid out and then likely with the dividends reinvested, your real rate of return should likely be far greater in all of these. We see Bank of Nova Scotia actually has negative returns over the last five years on a 10 year basis. Again, Bank of Nova Scotia underperforming significantly, giving you actually negative rate of returns, whereas the other four banks really giving somewhere between 60 to 70, even 80 percent capital growth. Now, moving on to their price to tangible book value, this is really a metric I like to take a look at for financials. We do it when we take a look at a JP Morgan or a Citigroup in the States. And so this is a metric we like to compare against the bank to itself over its really past five to 10 years. I have a 10 year price to tangible book pulled up for each of these. You see a company like Royal Bank of Canada trades relatively rich compared to the others, but on a historic 10 year, it is actually trading i'd say underneath its historic tenure anytime really this company goes below a price to tangible book of two it could be considered undervalued compared to its historical tenure average even a td bank does trade relatively rich compared to the other three you see your bank of nova scotia and cibc do trade closer to that 1.2 1.3 times a price to tangible book certainly during covid and when interest rates were nearing zero yeah, these banks traded at a price to tangible book far, far lower than they are today. BMO even traded underneath one for a brief moment in time. And so since then, they have recovered a little bit, but they have seen a relatively big sell off. And so you could consider from a price to tangible book value that these bank stocks are trading near a undervalued level compared to their historic tenure average. I say closer to 1.5 to really two times a price to tangible book is where all these banks have traded out in the past. Now, moving over to the fair value for all of these bank stocks, we'll jump into their valuations and take a look at some historic growth rates and then kind of determine a fair value based on what we expect the next five years to look at for each of these companies. From a price to earnings, all of them trade roughly in line somewhere between an eight and a half to really a 10 and a half times a forward price to earnings. You see RBC does trade at a premium to the other banks closer to an 11 times forward price to earnings, even on a price to sales closer to three times, whereas all the other banks are closer to two, two and a half times a forward price to sales. So roughly somewhere between a nine and 10 times 
price to earnings and then two, two and a half times price to sales is where I would say these bank values tend to stay at. In terms of their balance sheet, all these banks looking fairly healthy from a cash to debt ratio, all of them having a cash to debt ratio over really 1.3, except for a CIBC having a cash to debt ratio of just 0.8. And so that means they have more debt than cash on the balance sheet. Certainly nothing to really worry about. In my opinion, these banks are massive. And certainly I don't think you have the fears of really any of these banks collapsing just because of their balance sheet similar to what you had in the US over the, your regional banks. And so your CIBC having a cash to debt ratio underneath one, all the other banks looking fairly healthy, having a cash to debt ratio closer to two in my opinion. Now moving on to their five year historic average. Over the past five years, these banks have been growing revenues roughly between two to 5%. Again, a lot of these growth on that top line actually depends on the immigration rates over in Canada. Certainly these are your five big banks and anyone really coming to Canada is going to be looking to bank with one of these five major financial institutions. And so certainly there is a level of immigration and population growth that does affect revenue growth over at these banks, but they have been experiencing in that modest low single digit percent revenue growth on that EPS side. Most of these banks have actually seen declining net income and declining earnings over the past five years, especially considering how much money they've been putting aside for the provisions for credit losses as interest rates have really climbed substantially over the past, we'll call it one and a half year, closer to 18 months. Yeah, these banks have been putting aside a lot more provisions for credit losses, which ultimately causes earnings to decline for these banks. We see RBC actually has been posting earnings growth of closer to three and a half, four percent over the past five years. Now, moving on to their 2024 earnings estimates, so all of these companies reported their Q4 last week, that is Q4 of 2023. And so they have the next four quarters of 2024 to look forward to. We'll take a look at Scotiabank or Bank of Nova Scotia first. They are expected to post an EPS of $6.60 over the next year. Keep in mind, these are again, Canadian dollars. And so that would translate to a net income of close to $8 billion. For the next five years, I'm expecting compounded annual growth rate on that EPS side to come in at 5%. Again, all of these earnings will look higher than their previous five years, but keep in mind, these are based on estimates over on Wall Street and consider the fact that as interest rates begin to lower, yeah, these companies will likely bring back those provisions for credit losses and will likely see that as an addition to their bottom line instead of hurting their bottom line. In terms of the price to earnings on a forward basis, I expect Bank of Nova Scotia and really all these banks to trade closer to a 10 times forward price to earnings. Historically, that is where these banks have traded. Now, in terms of share dilution, I expect Scotiabank to buy back roughly half a percent of their shares outstanding every year, considering that's roughly in line to what they've been doing. Paying nearly a 6.95% dividend yield, I did take that into account when discounting my forward returns. So I expect all these companies to return somewhere roughly 12%, that's including their dividends and capital appreciation. That is a market beating return. And that is what you should expect when determining if it is a worthwhile place to invest. And so paying nearly a 7% yield, I applied a 5% discount rate and then have a margin of safety close to 10%. That brings our fair value at close to $60.76, just under $61. And that is roughly in line to where shares are trading at today and so considering these estimates of roughly five percent growth on that bottom line and a half percent share buyback and then earnings per share in this upcoming year of six dollars sixty cents certainly you can make a case that bank of nova scotia is fairly valued at today's prices now keep in mind these aren't really buy or sell targets it's just based on estimates we make where we would see our stock return our expected discount rate on an annualized basis Moving on to TD Bank, they are expected to post EPS of $7.95 in the upcoming 2024. That would represent net income close to $14.23 billion. I took their five-year future compounded growth rate on that bottom line to be 3%, slightly slower than a Scotia Bank. Again, applying a 10 times price to earnings multiple, no share dilution, but also no share buyback. They have a nearly 5% dividend yield, which would make our discount rate bit higher at 7% compared to a Scotiabank. Taking that same margin of safety at 10%, we get to a fair value of just under $60. That would represent nearly a 27, close to 28% downside 
from where shares are at at current prices closer to $81.90. Again, these aren't buy or sell targets. It's just where I would see a fair value for a company based on the estimates I make. Certainly, if you have higher estimates for a TD bank, if you expect them to grow maybe at 5%, that would certainly move your fair value higher. I tend to take more conservative estimates and I would rather be conservative and right when taking my five-year compounded annual growth rate. Moving on to BMO, they're expected to post EPS of $12.36. That would represent net income of $8.9 billion in 2024. I expect their compounded annual growth rate on that bottom line for the next five years to come in at 5.5%, a bit higher, actually the highest out of all of these banks. Again, applying a 10 times forward price to earnings multiple and a share dilution close to 2%. They have been diluting shareholders and not been buying back shares compared to the other banks. And so I expect share dilution of roughly 2%. They do pay a forward dividend of close to 5.3%, making their discount rate at 6.7%. Again, applying a 10% margin of safety, that would bring my fair value for BMO close to $95 a share. That would represent nearly 16% downside from today's prices. Looking at Canadian Imperial Bank or CIBC, they're expected to post EPS of $6.70. That would be net income close to $6.23 billion. They are expected to post compound annual growth rates of just 1% over the next five years on that earnings side. And so for that reason, I gave them a slightly lower price to earnings multiple considering their earnings are growing at the slowest clip out of any of these companies. Also, they might actually post flat to maybe even slightly negative compounded annual growth rates for that next five years. Yeah, their price to earnings should be a little bit lower at least compared to the others. And applying 1% share dilution, paying nearly a 6.3% forward dividend yield, that brings their discount rate at just over 5.5%. Again, applying a 10% margin of safety, that would bring my fair value for CIBC $41.21, representing a 27% decline in order to come down to my fair value. Now, last but not least, taking a look at RBC, this has been the best performing bank stock over really the last 10 years over in Canada. And so they are expected to post EPS of $11.43 for the upcoming year. That would be net income of close to $16.1 billion on that bottom line. They are also expected to grow earnings at 5% over the next five years, playing a 10 times forward price to earnings multiple and nearly a negative 1% share dilution as they do have a small buyback in place, close to a 4.5% dividend yield. That would bring their discount rate at just over 7.5%. Once again, applying a 10% margin of safety. We come to a fair value of close to $96.12. That would need to see a drawdown of nearly 22%. And so outside of a Scotiabank, all of these companies need to see a drawdown close to 15 to roughly 30% in order to come down to my fair values. And so to that, you might be saying, well, what's the point in looking at these banks now, considering in order to come down to my fair value, they need to see a relatively large drawdown. To that, I would say this is just one data point based on the estimates that I made. Certainly a discount rate of 12% can be seen as a bit aggressive. And so if you believe, if you're okay with receiving just a 10% rate of return that's including dividends and your capital growth well then your discount rates would come down a bit and your fair values would actually go up and so it's all dependent on what you expect as your rate of return for these companies what you expect over at the bottom line growth over at the next five years and the price to earnings multiple you apply and so from one perspective taking a look at the fair value yeah you could say that it needs close to a 15 to 20 percent drawdown in order to make sense from a fair value perspective. But again, we took a look at their price to tangible book values and almost all of these companies are trading underneath their historic 10 year price to tangible book. And so that is again, another data point that you should consider. Also consider the fact that these companies are reducing headcount, are taking one-time charges in order to increase their bottom line profitability down the road. They're also putting aside a ton of cash for the provisions for loan losses as we saw and really all of these companies and so keep that in mind that as these provisions for loan losses begin to come down, yeah, their bottom line can grow at a faster clip than what is anticipated. And so really as an investor, you have to take into account all these data points in order to make a good investment decision. Another thing to look at when investing is the technical charts for all these companies. 
I have a Bank of Nova Scotia chart pulled up. This is really over the last five years. You see, since 2022, this company has been locked in really a steady downtrend, making lower highs and lower lows. This company has been underperforming all of the other bank stocks, and you can really clearly see why as it's been locked in this downtrending channel. Now, it is near the top end of this channel, and so in order to really confirm a technical reversal, I would like to see Bank of Nova Scotia come up and post a candle above this channel and really post maybe one or two candles above this channel in order to really confirm it and then ideally come back and back test this range and then move higher. This will likely see some consolidation in between $62 all the way up to really $68, $70 in my opinion. I think this is a range where the stock will tend to consolidate after breaking out of this channel. Certainly it has the possibility to continue to get rejected and make a new set of lower highs and lower lows. But if it does come in here and break above this channel, I would like to see it close really above $62, $63 a share in order to confirm that technical reversal. Moving on to TD Bank, this one has been really channeling sideways over the past, we'll call it really two to three years, similar to how Bank of Nova Scotia has been underperforming in a downtrending channel. Yeah, TD Bank has really been channeling sideways between, we'll call it somewhere between 77 all the way up to $88, $90 a share. I think this one can be a good purchase near the lower end of the range, closer to $77 a share. Right now it's trading smack dab in the middle, close to 81. And so it seems like it is rolling over closer to the downside. And so if it does come down at 77, $76 a share, certainly you could begin a position in a company like this. This is, these all of these stocks really are long-term buy and holds. You're not really looking to trade in and out of Canadian banks. And so really dollar cost averaging at good entry points is really how I would play these Canadian banks. Certainly you have that dividend growth and high dividend yield over at these companies. Now you just wanna look to purchase them at relatively attractive entry points from both a fair value and technical perspective. And so for TD Bank, this one has been channeling sideways, certainly closer to $77 a share it could be considered a good buy. Moving on to Bank of Montreal, similar to a Scotia Bank, this one has been in a downtrending channel really since 2022 February. Very similar price action to Scotia Bank as it's been making this downtrending channel right now, trading closer to the upper end of the channel. I'd say if it can come in here, post a candle, a couple candles above 84, $85 a share. I think it has the ability to kind of channel in somewhere between 85 all the way up to really 95, maybe even $100 from a technical perspective. Again, this I would wait for it to break out above this technical channel, and then I would look to accumulate it anytime it heads near the lower end of that support line. Moving on to CIBC, ticker symbol CM. Similar to the other two stocks, this one has been making a downtrending channel, likely over the shorter term, not as far back as Feb of 2022 in a more well-defined downtrend since really July of 2022, but nonetheless, it is a downtrend. And so this stock has been really trading between close to $33. It did see a monster rally really over the past month, up from 35 all the way up to $41 a share. Again, similar to the other two, I would look for a strong breakout above the previous set of highs. If this one can come up here and test levels at $44, $45 a share, and then back test either this channel support line or even a support closer to $42 a share, back test that and then continue to move higher. That would be a sign of this downtrending channel really ending and a good technical point where I could see you accumulating shares of CIBC. Now from a fundamental perspective, this one did look relatively weak compared to the others as it had a cash to debt ratio of under one and the growth over at CIBC really not there compared to the other banks. So from a fundamental perspective, this one did look quite weak. If you do like the technical setup, I would, again, wait for a breakout closer to $44, $45 a share, wait for a reversal to confirm the end of this downtrending channel, and then on the lower end of this channel is really where I would look to come in and pick up shares of CIBC. Last but not least, taking a look at RBC, this is the New York Stock Exchange. Let's take a look at the TSX chart, very similar to the other banks, posting a downtrending channel, not quite as well-defined as the others, it does have a level of support really at $120 a share and then seeing a level of resistance all the way up to $135 a share.
anywhere really in here. This one has broken above this support line. And so you could see some momentum in RBC. This is also a fundamentally very strong bank over in Canada. And so you could see some technical momentum to the upside for RBC if it can come up here closer to $130, $133 a share, and then maybe see a sideways chop in this upper end of the channel. Again, this is a bank I would look to dollar cost average in really anytime it comes near the lower end of this channel while it's in a well-defined consolidation phase. Now, last thing I did want to mention is the Vanguard Canadian High Dividend Yield ETF. Now, this is a way to really invest in these Canadian institutions, these high yielding stocks over in Canada without taking the risk on an individual financial institution, individual bank, by really pl placing your money in this Vanguard ETF. It has a relatively low management fee, close to 0.22% of a management expense ratio, yielding closer to 5.2%. So you still get that high dividend yield on your investment. We take a look at their top 10 holdings and it really consists of these major banks along with a couple other oil and pipeline companies over in Canada. And so your top 10 holdings consist of RBC, Toronto Dominion, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, and then you have your other Canadian natural gas companies such as Enbridge, Canadian Natural Resources, even some communication companies like Bell and insurance companies like Manulife. And so this is an ETF that I think you could play in order to diversify into the Canadian markets, into just Canadian financials without taking the risk of a single institution. Similar to the banks we looked at, this is an ETF I would look to dollar cost average in over time, wait for that dividends to come in, expect dividend growth as well, instead of trading in and out and trying to time an ETF like this. That was my take on the five biggest banks over in Canada. Let me know your thoughts on these banks in the comment section below. Would you be looking to consider these Canadian banks in order to add some high yield diversification to your portfolios? As always, thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you guys in the next video.